Assassin's Creed Origins is the newest addition to the Assassin's Creed series, which has of course gotten out of control lately, but I'm not going to go too much into that. Although I do want to say I was actually looking forward to this one, despite the track record and stigma that the series has acquired over the years. Now, uh, like many fans, I've been kind of jaded by how they shit these out like Madden games. Fuck. Assassin's Creed is on Sibian? But, this one, at least upon its initial announcement, showed great promise. Now the first reason is, of course, Ancient Egypt is a really cool setting. Second reason is that it's got origins right there in the title, so you think, oh, this is gonna finally give me the origin of the greater Assassin's Creed Ancient Aliens plotline. First, let's kinda do a general overview here. Like the other Assassin's Creed games, you play as a modern day person Layla, in this case, who uses the Animus machine to relive the DNA memories of an ancient person, in this case, the Egyptian Bayek. Of course, like the other ones, it's an open world game, and the size of this map is actually really impressive. I'll leave a link to a video on the How Big Is The Map channel where a guy just walks across it. It's pretty big. Now, a map this big needs stuff to do, and this game does have it in the form of question marks and exclamation points dotted on the world map as you explore, a la The Witcher 3. Now, unfortunately, just like The Witcher 3, a lot of the question marks don't really lead to anything satisfying as much as they lead to you clearing bandit camps, mostly. By the way, get used to me making analogies comparing this to The Witcher 3 because this game does seem to borrow a lot of things from that. For example, the side quest system is very similar. Now, the side quests and origins can technically be done in no particular order, but in the menu they're enumerated by difficulty with player level. So that is to say that a quest that has a 37 next to it will have enemies in it that are balanced for a level 37 player. The map is open to you from the very beginning, it's just one long continuous map. There's nowhere that you can't just walk to, but although the map is open, it's not necessarily safe to travel everywhere. The map is divided into level zones. Now it says this on the map in a very clear, straightforward way with just the, the numbers playing for you. You must be this tall to come here. You must be level 27 to come here. Now you can go there without being level 27, but you'll probably die. Now, as a mechanic on its own, I don't really like this, but it works in the context of the game where you're not really given any more narrative clues as to how difficult each place is gonna be. Now, let's talk for a few minutes about why we would want to explore this map at all other than the graphics and how pretty it looks. So, pure checklist-style collectibles like the flags and feathers in the older games, those are kinda going by the wayside. Instead, what you're gonna find in this game is loot as your reward for exploring, mostly. Now I actually prefer this as a concept because it's a lot more rewarding if you can actually use what you find. Now unfortunately, even though there is a lot of loot in the game, in practice you will very rarely actually use the gear that you find just from exploring. Gear that's just kind of laying around as a reward for you to check places out. The best items are all obtained either through doing quests or buying them directly from Ubisoft, unfortunately. Wow, so cool! Now some games transcend the collectibles versus loot dichotomy and they combine checklist style loot with character upgrades or gear type loot like the Shouts in Skyrim where there's it's a checklist but it's still an upgrade, it's still loot when you find that. This game kind of flirts with that idea with the ancient tablets and tombs which give you an ability when you find it, a lot like the places of power in The Witcher and then the ancient mechanisms, which rewards you with these little plot threads of the greater ancient aliens plotline. Now unfortunately, this is executed very poorly, usually read in a monotone voice, and they, they go on way, way too long. Pro tip, to get these plot threads better, you should leave the room as soon as the voice starts talking, as soon as the mechanism starts explaining ancient alien stuff, and then just read the stuff later on Layla's laptop in the present day moments. And before I move on from this topic of rewarding exploration, I do want to mention something about this game that's not necessarily a big deal, but is near and dear to me. In Assassin's Creed games, or at least the ones that I used to play, there's another reward for exploring generally. When you find a historical monument or some building of significance, a little blurb gets populated in your menu, a little encyclopedia entry you can go back and look at later. Now this is a big deal because these games are all about climbing over buildings and monuments, and it's also all about historical fiction. Now unfortunately, this game did not include anything like that 
at launch as part of the main game, but Ubisoft was nice enough to, a few months later, add the Discovery Tour mode to the menu. The Discovery Tour mode is just the game map with no enemies or any objectives, and you just wander around with these little activatable nodes that tell you historical information about the setting. Now, although I would prefer this educational stuff to be integrated into the main game somehow, like they did with the older games, I do appreciate that they tried to do something else, and I see why they did it. Now let's talk about the combat and the gear and the upgrades, you know, most of the gameplay. So, like I said in the beginning, I haven't played an Assassin's Creed game in a really long time. So what I'm used to in these games is the one button hits guys, one button counters thing. You basically just stand there and guys take turns coming at you and you hit the counter button until the fight's over. If you never played those old games, the formula has also been done to death in the Warner Brothers licensed titles like the Lord of the Rings, uh, Shadow of Mordor, and the Batman games, of course, the Arkham games. I think this was best demonstrated in Donkey's video where he plays Arkham. I'll link it in the description. Check that out if you haven't seen it, or, or check it out if you have. Anyway, Assassin's Creed Origins does not use this. Instead, it uses a less specialized hack and slash action RPG type thing. There's, there's these rudimentary basic RPG elements like upgradable equipment, gear, and of course, a rudimentary skill tree. There's some cool skills you can unlock, like smoke bombs and sleep darts and animal training, which is great. But there are a few places where it looks like they just ran out of ideas. For example, the ability to skip and wait till another time of day is not something you can do from the beginning of the game. It's part of the skill tree and you're forced to spend points on it so that you can complete missions that you can only do at night. It really feels like just filler in the skill tree. Anyway, I think the combat generally feels nice. It's pretty fun and there's a decent amount of weapon variety. Melee weapons are typical hack and slash fare. and axes and maces hit harder but go slower. Swords are your average medium weapon in all respects. <laughs> the game does have some unique weapons like the curved blades and the speed based weapons like the scepters and twin daggers. Now, the curved blades because they add a bleeding effect to enemies that you hit and then the speed based weapons like the scepters and the twin daggers get a combo multiplier. Now where it really gets interesting and starts diverging is the ranged weapon. Now first you have your hunter bow. This is the one that you start the game with, the default introductory bow. And what kind of sets it apart is that you can charge the shots. You hold the drawstring back longer with the button, you let the button go, the shot does more damage. Then after that there's the light bow which allows you to do this rapid fire uh, legless type of stuff. Then you have the warrior bow which fires many arrows and an arc for massive close range damage, kind of the shotgun of the bows. And then finally, the most powerful item in the game, the Predator Bow. Now the Predator Bow lets you switch to first person for long range bow sniping. Every problem the game throws at you can be solved by the Predator Bow. This is an Assassin's Creed game, so there is a stealth element to it. You can play through most of the main quests without getting into direct confrontation. Now there are a couple boss fights that you have to do, but other than that, you can stealth your way through the game using mostly, like I said, the Predator Bow and then the little tools they give you, like the sleeping darts. But I didn't really find much use to use those things. The AI is not super great at what stealth game really does have great AI, though. So now that we've gone over the basics of the game, I do want to delve into some specifics. First, I'm going to talk about my favorite part of the game, exploring the ancient tombs. It's a bittersweet favorite to have, I tell you. Now first, the suite. The ambiance and the well-crafted atmosphere of these tombs is awesome. Now, for one thing, they're really dark, which is a big deal. So dark that you're gonna have to use a torch, which is really, really cool. Like when I play Skyrim, for example, and I go into the dungeons, it was always disappointing to me how they have ambient light and how there's not really anything creepy or menacing about the dungeons other than the ambient sound loops. So when I play the game, I have to install a mod that removes the ambient lighting from these places so that they feel creepy and I have to use a torch and can't see. This game gets that right right out of the box, which is a seemingly small detail that's a very big deal to me, and I feel like it's a very big part of the ambiance of Tomb Raider. So I covered the suite. I'm going to get into the bitter part of this being my favorite now. There is not much to actually do. Yeah, for all the historical liberties that they took everywhere else, they were apparently reluctant to insert that into the tombs outside of putting these ancient alien devices in it. I guess they weren't reluctant to do it in the tombs. I just don't understand why they didn't give the tombs more stuff to do. 
The puzzle and platforming sections aren't very challenging and really boil down to counterweight lift things where you put heavy things on one side to make the other side go up so you can access a new area or this other puzzle where you follow a light from mirror to mirror and sometimes you get to a mirror that's got a spider web on it so you gotta burn it off to see where the light goes to next. It's not really a puzzle. Not really satisfying, they're mostly time wasters. If you're not paying close attention, you're listening to a podcast while you're playing or something like that, you might get some sense of satisfaction out of this. But if you're actually paying attention, trying to get immersed in the tomb, trying to get through it and really appreciate what they put into it, you won't find much there. You know what really would've been cool is maybe some Indiana Jones rooms filling with sand or walls caving in or, I don't know, give me something to work with. If you're gonna take liberties, take liberties and make the tomb fun. Now, other than the tombs, there's something else I want to talk about in the setting. There's a lot of unused space. Like, entire regions of the map with nothing to do or explore in them. And what's especially funny is when you go online and discuss this, people just say, Dude, it's a desert! Look up desert! You fucking idiot! It's not supposed to be anything there! It's a desert! To this I say, oh, well, it's a game. It should be fun. Second, as I've already mentioned, realism isn't really an issue in this game. They cast it by the wayside in so many other places. Like for example, there's enchanted weapons that are just on fire all the time, there's swords with life drain, there's a skill that lets you control your arrows in the air, which is actually badass. It would be awesome and believable in the context of this game to put some more ancient tombs out here to dot the landscape or something. Anyway, let's move on to everyone's favorite subject, the plot. And yes, there will be spoilers, of course. Now in this game you play as Bayek. Bayek is a former Magi. What's a Magi? Magi is a bodyguard of the Pharaoh, ancient Egyptian policeman. Basically Bayek is a man who is newly without a purpose. Bayek loses his son in a violent incident perpetrated by the Order of the Ancients, which is a bunch of mass people that go by animal nicknames like the hyena, the lizard, the crocodile, etc. Naturally the game revolves around Bayek getting his revenge on these people by assassinating them. The narrative starts out really strong, not just because of the whole avenge my son's death thing, but also because the characters are cool and likable at first. Also, the whole Order of the Ancients thing is kind of a cool concept. And unfortunately, it doesn't take long for this to become a weird, jumbled mess full of filler characters that have no purpose in the story. So, I actually love the idea of itemizing a team of enemies, a team of bosses, Kind of like the Lords of Cinder and Dark Souls, like every Metal Gear game, like the gym leaders in Pokemon, Organization 13, an itemized team of enemies for you to go and fight, an elite squad of enemies. But what makes it work so well in those other games is that each member has a unique identity and a unique role to play, not only within their organization, but within the story that makes them make sense. Assassin's Creed Origins seems to forget that. With a few exceptions, these characters kind of just blend together and become filler villains. Uh, let's go over them. Number one, the Heron. Literally who? I, I know nothing about this guy other than the fact that he's in the Order. And what's more is Bayek chooses to kill him first. And it's never really explained why or what connection Bayek has to this guy other than the fact that he's in the Order. I've even done the optional side quests later and really all you learn is that his girlfriend was sad when he died. Number two. The Ibis. Now, this guy is the first member of the Order that the game spends any real time on, and he's pretty well established as a dick, but what's more, he's one of the only ones whose role in the Order is actually explained. He's there trying to open the vault beneath Siwa. That I can buy, that I understand. And he also gets bonus points in the story for the way Bayek kills him by bludgeoning him to death with the orb. It's very satisfying, but it's a bit of a tease because the death scenes from this point on don't really live up to that. Number three, the Ram, and number four, the Vulture. Uh, literally who? Aya kills both these guys off screen before your journey really starts, and that's not terrible as a story element per se. It reinforces that Aya is a strong, powerful woman that don't need no Bayek, but we don't go on to find anything about their place in the Order or the larger plot. In any case, these two members of the Order are irrelevant and might as well not be in the game. And moving on to number five, the Hippo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only remarkable thing about assassinating this guy is that you do it in a bathhouse where Bayek will be clean shaven regardless of how you have him configured, but that's just nitpicking. I'm getting off track. The point is you don't learn anything about this guy, what his place in the order is, why he's a villain. The next four targets are introduced to you all at once in a small cutscene with Cleopatra, and they are the Scarab, the Hyena, the Lizard, and the Crocodile. 
Now the sequence in which you kill these next four is kind of up to you, kind of not. Now this is to say, it's an open world game. You can go wherever you want and kill whoever you want, but just like the side quest thing I talked about earlier where there's a level difficulty, there is a level difficulty attached to each target. So you basically have to do them in the order the levels dictate. Just how like in The Witcher, you're not gonna go to Skellige before you do Novigrad, unless you're going through the map and doing every single question mark like I did in both games, in which case you'll be overpowered for whatever it throws at you. Now it's time to talk about number six, the Scarab. The Scarab is one of the better developed villains, but you still don't learn that much about him. Uh, what makes it interesting is that you meet him earlier in the quest and then he betrays you later. That's pretty much it. You don't really learn what role he has in the order unless I miss something. Number seven, the Hyena. This one is by far the best developed character in the Order of Ancients, maybe even the best developed character in the game. I learn her role in everything, she's getting Silica for the Order of the Ancients. I learn her motivation, which is she wants to bring her daughter back from the dead. She thinks the Silica can activate the ancient devices and that that will bring her daughter back somehow. Very well established. This is what I would have liked to see with each villain so that I could be consistently interested instead of just interested punctually. Number eight, the lizard. Literally who? And we've learned so little about this guy other than the fact that he's a priest gone bad, but we don't learn why he's a priest gone bad, what his motivations were, or what could have turned a priest to the Order of Ancients, a hunger for power? Who knows? Would have been really cool if they could have put that in there. It almost sounds like it would write itself, and it's especially jarring because it takes place right after the hyena for most players, the most well-developed member of the Order. And what's more is earlier when Cleopatra is introducing the Order of the Ancients to you, when she mentions the lizard, she talks about some sort of diabolical ceremony happening and they're worshipping a head, it looks like. Nothing ever comes of that, it's never brought up again, which is really weird, because it seems like I was excited to learn what was going to happen with that, and, and you never do. Unless I'm missing something, please let me know. Moving on, number nine, the crocodile. Now, literally who? Again, now I will say that this quest leading up to her is relatively strong. It involves the death of a, a little girl, which is just like the death of Pyke's son is kind of a freebie for the narrative. And it also has this cool gladiator arena thing where you fight with one of Pyke's old friends. And where this part slumps is when it's time for the big reveal. Okay, who killed the little girl? Who was it? Is it this tournament host guy from the Colosseum? Is it him all along? Maybe it was the girl's dad. Whoa, mind blowing, right? Wouldn't that be crazy? No, it's uh, who? Who's this? What are you, the mayor? What is she, the mayor? Who is this? Where did this character come from? It really would have been a long way in the narrative to have this character appear here and there before this, maybe even as an Easter egg in the background or something like that. Maybe, I, maybe I'm completely missing it and it was there, but it really just seems like this character comes out of nowhere and it's not very satisfying to kill her. And I want to be satisfied when I murder. And don't give me some crock of bullshit about how, oh, in real life, the crocodile could be anyone. It could be anyone in the town. It doesn't have to be someone you know. Well, this isn't real life, all right? This is a drama. This is a story. And it's very clear earlier in the game that they're going to throw out believable historical fiction to make a good drama. Then why not do that? Number nine. Literally who? I do want to comment his death scene is pretty cool. And we do find out he's a eunuch, which I guess is, is, is a neat detail. And moving on to number 10, the lion. Literally who? I think he's the main villain or something. I don't know, the writers don't really tell you who he is or how he's relevant in all this until he gets the orb and he becomes a, a bad guy who wants to kill everyone or, or something like that. I don't know because the lion who I think is the main villain is introduced to you in like the last 30 minutes of the game. It doesn't, I don't fucking understand any of this. What I do know is interesting, when Bayek goes to finish him off, he finds that he can't do it after, can't do it. after all this, which makes no sense at all. Suddenly, I, I can't kill someone? I've been killing people indiscriminately for like the last 40 hours, Bayek. It didn't make any sense to me other than to like add some weird uh, hills and valleys to the last scene, I guess, to make the game feel longer, to make it feel like it had more to it. I don't know, I'm just guessing. Maybe they were scared Bayek was getting too unsympathetic and robotic by this point. I mean, he was, but this scene didn't really do anything to help it. And I'll get into that in just a minute. But first, I want to round out this list with number 12, the Jackal. Literally who? Septimius is both the third to last boss fight and the last boss fight. 
And the first time, he's there just kind of waiting for Bayek for no reason. The second time, he's guarding Caesar from Aya. And that's odd, too, is that you fight the last boss fight of this game with Aya, not with Bayek. Now, I don't particularly mind playing as Aya. It's fun. She's agile. She looks like she would be a good assassin. It's fun. But it is kind of a slap in the face that I have to play the last boss fight with a character that I didn't just level up for 40 hours and that I didn't just collect all this gear for. It's a little ridiculous and it also creates this weird disconnect between me and the action on screen. As I'm relearning how to play with a different character that took different skills and uses different tools and different gear, unless you just happened to have upgraded Bayek in the exact same tree that she's upgraded, which is possible. But who is he? Did he kill Bayek's son? Flavius kill Bayek's son? I don't know. I really don't even know what's going on by this point. I'm just trying to get through it. Anyway, these last three members of the Order of the Ancients, the Jackal, the Lion, and the Scorpion, I don't know who they are or why I should care, really. They're introduced pretty late in the game to be the main villains. I guess it's kind of implied that maybe maybe they're the founding members of the Knights Templar or of Stergo or something. And I'm kind of going out on a limb there. The game doesn't really tell you much about them. It just tells you that you know, they're bad, and that they have the orb, and they're bad. Now, I'm gonna get off into speculation territory here. And obviously, I wasn't present for the development of this game. I'm not near smart enough for that. But to me, the game really feels rushed and hurried. My unsolicited suggestion would be to take the filler bad guys, get them the fuck out, and then flesh out some of these other ones a little bit more. Maybe Flavius the lion, since he's like the main villain apparently, or or something. Or is Caesar the main villain? It's... God, it's just so confusing. That's all I want to say about the Order of the Ancients specifically, and since they are a main focus of the plot, their shortcomings are the plot shortcomings. However, there are a few other little problems with the plot that I kind of had to nitpick. Like, for example, the Apple of Eden or the Golden Orb stuff. Now, despite these objects being present in the game, nobody really talks about them, the least of which the main characters. And only the villains express basic human curiosity about what they are, what the fuck's even going on here. Assuming you do none of the optional tomb raiding where Bayek sees some crazy shit and also says nothing, and the fight with Flavius, he summons all these, like, ghostly apparitions, like the fight at the end of the first Assassin's Creed game, and Bayek has, has really nothing to say about any of it, or, or makes any observation or expresses any interest in it at all, really. It, it just seems to just go right past him, and it makes him feel inhuman and, and, and robotic. It's, it's especially strange because of how relatable and quippy and wisecracking he was earlier in the story, even after his son's death. Look, I understand he's supposed to be this good guy that just wants the best for Egypt and doesn't want no part of that shit, but he should at least acknowledge it to feel real. It really sucks because I really wanted to be attached to Bayek. He's so likable at the beginning, but as the story goes on and he fails to make basic observations about what's going on around him, he stops being relatable, he stops feeling real, and it hurts. Number two, Aya and Bayek's relationship. So. Like pretty much everything else in the story, early on this is really cool and feels natural, but quickly becomes this kind of robotic chore. It doesn't feel like they even like each other. Now later on they do break up and I think maybe we're supposed to assume that their changing lifestyles and their son dying has made their relationship untenable, but they don't really do a good job of expressing this. It's kind of, I'm kind of assuming all that based on how maybe real people or, or real characters might act in those circumstances. Number three, why do we kill Caesar? I really don't know this. Why do we kill Caesar? He just seems like he's just a puppet of the more nefarious bad guys. Doesn't really seem like he needs to die. I guess they just wanted to integrate the famous assassination of Julius Caesar into the game somehow. The temptation to throw this iconic moment into the game is too much to pass up. And I don't think necessarily that they shouldn't have been able to do that. I just would have liked to I don't know, have more of a reason to kill him. Number four, the founding of the Assassin's Brotherhood. So the whole game, I'm waiting patiently for the great payoff where Bayek forms a tight-knit clan of assassins. You know, the Assassin's Creed origins. This part's not given the attention it deserves, I think. It feels rushed, it doesn't feel organic at all. In fact, Bayek just starts using the words Brotherhood and Creed like he played the other games or like he read ahead in the script and maybe he did play the other games That would certainly explain why he's got nothing to say about the magic Apple of Eden shit that's going on 
There's no narrative reason for him to start the Assassin's Brotherhood, other than the, the vague notion that he's some kind of vigilante who's forming his own Justice League or something. It's really disappointing and it really feels like they were writing the story of the game and then they got towards the end and then they remembered, oh yeah, this is an Assassin's Creed game. The origins of the Assassin's Brotherhood is supposed to happen somewhere, so they just kind of threw it together. Like, like the, they get the symbol for the Brotherhood from by dropping the bird skull in the sand, or is, isn't it the symbol from the Magi Shield, or? Wait, I thought it was just like a box cover marketing, it's like an A for Assassin, right? But, yeah, this really sucks because I was really looking forward to learning the origins of the story. I got duped! And if you thought you were gonna find out a good origin story in this game, you got duped too. Feels like they were just running out of Assassin's Creed stories to do, so they're like, let's let's do an Origins game, and we'll put Origins on the title, and this will be this will bring everyone back in. And you know what? It brought me back in, and I, I gotta say, I'm disappointed. That about sums up my nitpicky review of Assassin's Creed Origins. I hope you enjoyed it. I would say it's a pretty fun game and that you should pick it up on a sale if you can. Under no circumstances should you pay full price for this game. 